And we are here today to celebrate marriage. And on that theme, um, it seems that somebody has lost their wedding ring. So I have a ring on my finger. <laughs> Come and get it if it's yours. <laughs> well, I need it cl closer to me. Can you hear me now? So to start out our day with weddings, I have somebody's wedding ring or ring. So find me later. And yes, I'm not proposing. You can take it off my finger. <laughs> we are here today to celebrate those clergy and lay people who have been organizing across our connection to say all people can get married. Not at the moment. Now, a little tidbit. Uh, I'm lucky enough that I get to work in the state of Washington, where this year it will be the first time that voters, citizens of the state, will be voting to approve marriage. And it's going to happen. It's going to happen. <laughs> So we, as United Methodists, need to keep up with our states. It used to be we were the conscious of society. Now we're going to need to come along with society. But here today we have the opportunity, opportunity, opportunity to be in ecclesiastical disobedience because it's the right thing to do. We celebrate today with our 13 conferences that have already signed petitions and passed legislation to say that clergy will do weddings. And we're here today to invite the rest of you to go back home and do the same. Amen? Amen. So let us today start our celebration of celebrating weddings, marriages, and clergy commissioning. I invite now Amy Jo Burr from the Minnesota Annual Conference to lead us in prayer and uh, sanctify this space. Well, she's welcoming. Okay, excuse me. Amy Jo is welcoming. Jan Bowler Jack will be praying. Okay. Welcome. I'm told that's what I'm to do. And we are very delighted to have such a full tent tonight and I want to welcome everyone who's gathered here. We have a number of the press who's gathered with us today. We have laity, we have clergy, and I'm told that we have a number of bishops who have joined us here today. We welcome you today and I understand that for many of us we're in a time of uh, despair and just unhappy feelings about everything that we're experiencing at this general conference. But even in the midst of all of that, we do want to celebrate the ways that we're moving forward. And so this is to be a celebration today, even in the midst of this particular general conference to celebrate the roughly 1,200 or more clergy who have signed an official statement saying that they joyfully affirm that they're going to offer God's grace and blessing through Christian marriage to all prepared couples who come to them regardless of their gender. So we'll do that today. Welcome to the tabernacle. Welcome to altar for all. And we just want to say thank you to everyone who worked so very hard to bring us to this place today. Because those 1,200 or so signers did not appear yesterday. They've appeared over the course of a year, a very hard hard work of writing and organizing and commitment. So we thank all of those of you who were part of that commitment and that work. Welcome and let us welcome the person who will pray. <laughs> let us pray. Oh God, you do indeed gather us. 
despite what anyone says. It's your welcome of grace that greets us here. This is your new day, and we are your blessed people. Oh God, we know that some of us come weary, questioning our commitment, our place in this church, our ability to continue. We know that the church has said that we are denied full participation. Our gifts and graces are restricted, even those gifts and graces that you have entrusted to us. And yet some of us are even more inspired and more determined and more dedicated and more ready to speak truth and tell our stories because of what we have seen and heard. Oh God, we had hoped for walls taken down and find them more solid than ever. And so we write our prayers on these walls and we peek over them and we yell across them saying, someday, someday. Gather us, O oh God. Our greatest gift is your love. Your love for each of us, cherished and blessed. And as we come together, even in this difficult place, we celebrate those places in our lives where there is acceptance, where love is recognized, where people speak truth. May we indeed find our place in your great line of prophets and priests. We give thanks for those who have led the justice mo movement to this moment in time, and we place hope in those who will follow after us. We know we can't do it all. We are but a piece of your work. For today, O oh God, O oh healing God, mend our hearts, fill our spirits, co continue to entrust us with the tasks of justice and mercy, Help us to listen and care for one another. We are your people here, now, today, and into the future. And you are our God, always and everywhere. Amen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Bruce Robbins from Hennepin Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It's good to be with you. Uh, just about a year ago, we in Minnesota placed before the annual conference by personal privilege a statement of um, saying that we were going to offer the blessing of Christian marriage to all prepared couples who came from us, and I'm so excited that it caught on and spread to other annual conferences as well. There are four reasons that I came to my mind why I was doing this and involved. The first was that I had been in ordained, in ordained ministry for 35 years and I had just not done enough. Does anyone else share that position? Um, secondly, um, as an ally in the movement, I thought it was wrong for the overwhelming burden to be on the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered persons and not on the allies. And we needed to step up. I needed to step up. And, and then, that's, and then thirdly, I f realized that I needed to move from ecclesial obedience and biblical disobedience to biblical obedience and ecclesial disobedience. And fourth, something that's been very much on my mind here, is I had been placed at the 2008 General Conference on the worldwide committee for, the, for the, the committee to address and restructure the worldwide nature of the church. And the committee was a dismal failure. And it accomplished absolutely nothing after spending a great deal of money on your behalf. And having us educated through listening posts and that not being able to move forward. So all of that persuaded me that we can't work only within the structures, we gotta work without outside of the structures as well. And so where in the future do we go? I'm, um, I've asked the congregation that I serve that if they will declare that they have an altar for all where all people are welcomed to, to be married in the church, even though it is still illegal in Minnesota and may be for a while, we at the church can perform Christian marriage. We cannot do civil 
marriage, but we can do Christian marriage. And that is our intention, and I pray the church will do that. And lastly, is that I hope that we enter into a time of non-cooperation, that we enter into a time of biblical obedience and go back to our churches and say, it is time. If they bring us to, to trial, so be it. Let us overwhelm them to such an extent that we just are faithful, faithful to what God calls us to be. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I am Mary Kay Toddy. I am the pastor of Dumbarton United Methodist Church. And while I have only been there three years, I celebrate all those that went before, for we have been a reconciling congregation for 25 years. And what got our butts in gear around marriage equality was when it became obvious that the District of Columbia was heading to make marriage equality legal in the District of Columbia. So we said, okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to respond? And the church worked together through a discernment process. I wrestled with my fear and what it meant to be an elder in the United Methodist Church and choose to take a stand to commit to do marriages for everyone. And out of that wrestling process, I wound up in a place where I knew I had to be faithful to what I knew was right and whatever happens, happens. I am responsible for my decisions and my actions, and whatever happens, happens. So we go forward. So initially, the response in Washington, D.C. by United Methodist Churches was all local, and each church was kind of doing their own thing, and that was the way for a couple of years. And then last year, after our annual conference, we heard what the Minnesota annual conference did, led by Bruce Robbins. And we thought, oh, now that's a great idea. We need to organize and get as many people as possible signing that they are willing to do marriages for everyone. So we started into that process as well. And here are some ha practical hands-on steps if you want to organize in your annual conference of some things to keep in mind. They are in no particular order. First, talk to colleagues. I said no particular order, and then I said first. Forget that. <laughs> talk to some colleagues who may be sympathetic. Get to know that you are not going to be the only one. There will be someone else out there who is also committed to same gender weddings. And if it's not a United Methodist colleague, maybe it is an ecumenical colleague. Remember to engage the retired clergy. We have, we have a website in our conference for all of the clergy who are committed to marriage equality. And the ones that have signed on, 18 are active, the rest are retired. And the retired clergy stand ready to do weddings for everyone. Review and update your congregational wedding guidelines. So think through how your wedding guidelines are and how they might be improved and how they will be applied to all couples. One of the things my congregation decided to do is at every wedding, there will be two clergy presiding. Every wedding will have two clergy presiding. This points to our connectionalism. It points to the importance of the community and it never leaves any one person out there all by themselves. That might not be an option in your situation, but it's something to consider. 
Um, you may need to find premarital counseling resources that will apply for same gender couples as well <coughs> as Apologies. Bad cold this week. <coughs> it's very hard when someone depends on their voice to not have a voice. Get a website, <laughs> establish a website where you can list <coughs> who, is, who is committed. You have to figure out whether it will be a public list or a private list. When your state has marriage equality legalized, it will be ever more important that it be a public list so that those out there know where they can find a pastor who will honor and recognize their love and loyalty and celebrate a wedding for them. Know within yourself why you are doing it and why you are making such a commitment. For me, it came down to my own sermons coming back to convict me. Don't you hate it when that happens? And I had preached for years that we kept asking not what is the right thing to do, but can we get away with it? And I was usually thinking in terms of those people that kept cheating on their taxes or cheating on their spouse or speeding through a school zone or and then I realized I knew the right thing to do around marriage equality, but I had been asking, could I get away with it? Then there was the guy in my church when we were talking about this, and Miguel said, well, I'm going to stand for the fact that we're going to do the right thing and get away with it. <laughs> that kept us going. Be generous with grace to colleagues who are in different places. Colleagues of mine in the Baltimore Washington Annual Conference are approaching this in very different ways, even pastors of other reconciling congregations. And it's very easy to slip into that sense of self-righteousness. Well, if I've made this why decision, why haven't they? But we need to make sure that we have a generosity of grace that recognizes there are all kinds of ways to advance the cause of full inclusion for gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people and their partners and families. And there's not only one right way to do it. The other thing is weddings are not our stories. Weddings are the stories of the couples being married. It's the stories of their love and loyalty. It's their story of what it means to them to come together and make a commitment, a lifelong commitment, to be in relationship with each other, to care for each other. And it's not the story of who is officiating. It's the story of the couple and the couple has the right to share that story in whatever way they choose. So those are my thoughts on how to go about organizing for marriage equality. And if it is not yet legal in your jurisdiction, 
then go on and organize around holy unions so that when it does become legal, it's real easy to make the transition. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Matt Mustard, and I am a staff member at Foundry United Methodist Church and a marriage organizer in the Baltimore Washington Conference. I wanted for us just to spend a moment to spend a moment and focus on two things. One, where we're at now, and two, where we're going. So I hope you can just take a moment and indulge me. We're gonna do a quick check-in with the conferences that already have organizers. So as I call out your conference, either shout out the number of people who have already signed on, or just show that energy and excitement that you have that's driven you to organize in your conference. So again, shout out the number, or just shout out. Make a joyful noise. Okay, so let's start with Baltimore, Washington. Shout out 52. 52. There we go. <laughs> California, Nevada. 114 from California, Nevada. Minnesota. 75. 75 from Minnesota. New York. 170. 170. New England Annual Conference. 191. 191. Northern Illinois. One more time, 213. There we go, 213. Oklahoma Annual Conference. 63. Oregon, Idaho. 74. Pacific Northwest. Pacific Northwest. 17 individuals and the whole Pacific Northwest Annual Conference. 17 individuals in the entirety of the conference signed on board. Rocky Mountain. A joyful noise. Okay, I like it. <laughs> Tennessee. Also a joyful noise. Okay, there we go. Upper New York. 43. And lastly, Western Michigan. 56. Excellent. For those who have not organized yet in your conference, quick show of hands, who is going to be the next conference to sign on board? New Jersey. New Jersey. I'm here in New Jersey. Calpac. Cal Cal All right. Some good energy already started to keep us North Georgia. There we go. There we go. <laughs> So to keep us moving in that direction, we have two resources on the table. The first is the covenant language that you see here down at the base of the podium. It's re replicated on those small sheets. We encourage you to read through the statement. And as you're moved to sign in support, there is a laity copy and there's a clergy copy. So please take a moment, read through that throughout the rest of the event, and then turn those back in to either your table leaders or the hospitality team at the front of the tent. Detroit Annual Conference started one about a month before General Conference. We have 30 signatures so far. Excellent. If you couldn't hear that, Detroit just started and they have 36 signatures so far. And then the second resource you'll see is this pledge card. You'll notice on the pledge card there's so far only four options. That does not mean there are only four ways in which you can get involved in your conference as you return back home. There's lots of white space. We encourage you to write in as you feel called to organize, to, activ to activate others into action, um, to really make our church that more inclusive and more biblically true church that we know it can be. So again, fill these out as you feel called. There's a prayer of discernment on the back. And I just got handed the number. We're up to 100, what, 1,115 so far, just from the numbers in this room. So again, fill out these cards, give them back to your leaders. We would love to have more people sign on. But the wonderful thing about the people gathered right now, the people around the table and the people throughout this tent come from a variety of standpoints and on this continuum, continuum of organization. We have some conferences that you've already heard, very vocal, very active in their organizing. We have some conferences, North Georgia saw a lot of great energy, who are maybe taking that next step. We have some clergy members who are active and open in their uh, 
blessing of same gender and same sex couples. And we have some congregations and clergy members that are still exploring what that may look like. So please, really take this moment of discernment into your heart and see where you might be able to move from here. I'll draw my time to a close. Remember to fill out as you feel called and get these back to your table leaders. And I will turn the microphone over to Reverend Greg. Oh, to Bishop Talbert, excuse me. Yep. Good afternoon. Let's see. Let's get this up a little bit. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. To all of to all of my sisters and brothers here on the dais and to all of you who are in the audience. I greet you in the name and in the spirit of Jesus. Okay, all right. Yeah. To all of the colleagues here on the dais and to my sisters and brothers in the audience here, greetings in the name and in the spirit of Jesus Christ. I'm delighted to stand in your midst this afternoon as we respond to the contemporary realities regarding the role and place of GLBT people in our church. Before going further, I simply want to acknowledge the presence of my colleague bishops. There are some of them standing right here. And then there are those like my colleague Jack Tool, who is over here. Are there others? Oh, Jack Tool over here. Are there Elias Galvan over here? I just I just spread it the word, and many colleagues I talked to, they were busy doing some other things, and they couldn't be here but my deep gratitude to those who could be here and I'm delighted that they came. Now while I acknowledge their presence, I want to be very clear. I am not speaking in behalf of the Council of Bishops, nor am I speaking in behalf of my colleagues who are standing here. I'm speaking only for myself. I want to begin by acknowledging the presence of my good friend Bruce Robbins that we have worked together ecumenically over the years. And it's probably because of him more than anybody else that I find myself standing here now because when I was in, when there was a meeting of some concerned clergy from across the church meeting at his church in Minnesota, I called and asked, uh, do you think the presence of a retired bishop would be a distraction? <laughs> and because I did, really didn't want to be a distraction. And he told me no. And I went. And I think as a result of that, I finally was invited to be on the board of RMN. 
And I'm now, and I'm now the vice chair of that board. I share that to simply say that as a bishop, and especially as a retired bishop, you have two things left, your name and your position that you can still use as influence. I know that, I know that, and I know my colleagues in Orium Inn were very astute when they invited me to vice, be vice chair. <laughs> But let me get on with what I want to say to you this afternoon. As you know, our Love Your Neighbor campaign coalition came to this general conference with the hope that after 40 years, our church would finally open its doors to all persons, especially GLBTQ people. But that was not to be. When Moses confronted Pharaoh saying God, sharing God's word, saying, let my people go. Pharaoh hardened his heart. In the case of this general church, it has hardened its heart to a GLBT people. So for the next four years, we have the derogatory, hurtful, discriminatory language regarding you remaining in our book of discipline. Hoping to be proven wrong, I came to this general conference not expecting any movement in our church toward GLBTQ people. Unfortunately, I was right. So I come here this afternoon with a heavy heart, weighing the steps and the actions I would take to let this church and the larger community know where I stand on this matter. As I stand before, here this, before you here this afternoon, I declare that God has already settled this matter. All, all human beings are created in the image of God. Yes. There are no exceptions, no exclusions. Yes. We belong to the family of God. At the same time, I declare to you that the derogatory language and restrictive laws in the Book of Discipline are immoral and unjust and no longer deserve our loyalty and obedience. Thus I, thus, I think the time has come for those of us who are faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ do what is required of us. You know the story. A young lawyer approached Jesus and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And rather than answering the question, Jesus turned the table by asking him, what is written in the law? And the proud young lawyer said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. To which Jesus said, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. My sisters and brothers, I declare to you that same gospel imperative to us gathered here today. Do this and we will live. Now, as always, the challenge is, what shall we do? Now, I arrived at this general conference thinking that the time had come to call for ecclesial disobedience. 
But in consultation with many of my colleagues, including one standing here, I came to the conclusion that I needed to modify that thinking just a little bit. So in light of the actions taken by this general conference, I believe the time has come to call and invite others to join in what I'm calling an act of biblical obedience. Yeah. You see, we too have the good book on our side. Based on the two-fold commandment of love, you should love the God, Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. This is our biblical march in ownership. What does that mean? I call on the more than 1,100 clergy who have signed the pledge to stand firm on their resolve, I stand firm on their resolve to perform marriages among same-sex persons, same-sex couples, and to do so in the normal course of their pastoral duties, thus defying the laws that prohibit them from doing so. Plus, I encourage you to invite your congregations to support and help you in efforts to be faithful to the gospel by taking actions to support you in using local church facilities for such marriages. Also, I call on my colleague bishops, district superintendents, boards of ordained ministry and investigating committees to be pastoral in implementing any complaints against clergy who perform same-sex marriages. I did so back in 1999. When 68 clergy performed the Holy Union in Sacramento, I said I would implement the decision of the General Conference, but I spoke boldly to the press and to the church saying, while I do this, it's one of the most painful decisions that I had to make. But I also said then, as I say now, the church's position is wrong and I don't support it. In 1960, I made the commitment to nonviolence and chose to disobey unjust laws of racial segregation and discrimination that was a serious act which resulted in many of us going to jail to pay the price. Thus, I know the seriousness of what I'm suggesting for you in our church. There, are, there probably will be some consequences for some of, what, some of you for what is being asked. has been said by others before me here today. You need to work with your churches, work with yourself, and do what you need to do based on how you understand your commitment to be to the call of Jesus Christ upon your life. I conclude simply with these words. The time for talking is over. It's, it's, it's time for us to act in defiance of unjust and immoral and derogatory words of discriminations and laws that are doing harm to our GLBT sisters and brothers. The time for talking is over. It is action time. And so may God bless each of us as we seek to do what the prophet calls us to do. Micah, do justice, love mercy, 
and walk humbly with God. God bless you. Thank you, Bishop Talbert, for your prophetic stance and your prophetic words. We're going to go right to the uh, closing, but before I, I uh, launch into the closing, I want to uh, make a quick announcement. The Westboro Baptist Church has showed up. Uh, they are right outside, um, and uh, they're right on the sidewalk, right outside. So please, I urge you, do not engage with them. Do not go near them. Um, do not try to engage in any conversation with them at all. Um, that's the best thing to do. I'm going to ask the uh, Foundry Choir to make its way over here. What? Okay. You all could sing from there. And I'm going to ask uh, all of us to stand. We're going to hear a blessing from the uh, United Methodist book, Common Worship, which is said to uh, couples who are being wed. This is a closing. And then we're going to conclude with uh, Draw the Circle Wider. So this is the pastor to the people. Bear witness to the love of God in this world. so that those to whom love is a stranger will find in you generous friends. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And the peace of the Lord be with you always and also with you. Take it away, Foundry. Wow.